just to give you a sense of what I'll be presenting today, <clears throat> give you a little bit of an overview, um, I'd like to start with a personal story, so my testimonio, if you will, um, and I'm going to weave that testimonio throughout the presentation. Um, it's a method that I use in my research and my teaching, so hopefully um, it'll be effective here. I'm going to talk about um, Chicano studies as a field and then provide a brief genealogy of Chicana feminism, which is uh, you know, where I really sort of focus um, my research and teaching. And then I'll talk a little bit about how I initially started te teaching Chicano studies um, courses and then how I employ um, Chicano and ethnic studies frameworks in my um, own classes and my research. And then uh, I'll conclude by discussing some sort of practical tips for um, thinking about incorporating those frameworks um, into your own classes and, and research and working with um, students. So today, I'm a professor, but the road getting there starts in a small rural New Mexico town, as Deborah mentioned. In some of my classes, I use this I am from poem format, and some of you might use this in your classes as well. Um, so I'm going to share a bit about myself and read mine to you. I'm from love, from, from a woman who wanted a daughter and who loved old music. Think Karen Carpenter, that's how I got my name. <laughs> I'm from a small village surrounded by water, mountains, and chismen. I'm from pine trees that shed flavorful piñon and poke needles. I'm from musicians who play lancheras, dancers who like polkas, and bad joke tellers. From Jose Maria and Delfina. I'm from the generous spirit of my father and the tenderness and care of my mother. From the someday you'll appreciate this place to the you'll always come home. I'm from La Virgen de Guadalupe and the strong Catholic upbringing that I questioned often. I'm from Pecos, Chicana and Mestiza identity, New Mexico green chili, I know I'm in Pueblo, but sorry, <laughs> and tortillas. From a family who loves to tell stories. The older brother who hated me tagging along but now calls me just to say hi and the books on my mom's shelves that influenced my own that are now also overfilled. I'm from love, from my family, my beloved home in New Mexico, my Jeffy Pop and my daughter, my sweet Summer Luna, who's pictured there on the bike. <clears throat> so I share this simple poem with you to think about the intersections of my identity. As you can probably tell, my identity is complex. I can't be described in just one way. So today I'll share with you some of the reasons I believe in the significance of Chicano studies. I didn't always embrace Chicano studies as part of my identity. And when I think back about why that was, it was because it wasn't something that I had a name for. And I certainly wasn't taught about Chicano studies during most of my educational experiences. Though I knew that the rancheras, the chili tortillas in my hometown were tied to my racial and cultural identity, I didn't fully understand Chicano culture. I didn't realize that when my dad and his siblings told stories about the past, that I was receiving the lesson in Chicano oral history. <clears throat> that when my grandma made tortillas, enchiladas, arroz, capirotada, that I was receiving the lesson in Chicano food traditions. That when my brother, dad, and cousins played rancheras at family weddings and other parties, I was receiving a lesson in Chicano musical traditions. And I certainly didn't think that when my mother told me that as a brown woman, I take on a combination of challenges that other women might not face, that I was receiving the lesson in Chicana feminism. It wasn't until I enrolled in a class at the University of New Mexico taught by Catherine S. Ramirez called Chicana Feminism and Science Fiction that I discovered the language to articulate and the critical thinking skills to analyze my experiences as a Chicana from New Mexico. That class propelled my abilities and desire to make sense of my identity. Dr. Ramirez, who was a Chicana from LA, talked openly about what it was like being a first-gen college student at UC Berkeley, how she and her sisters dealt with racism, sexism, and being young Chicanas, navigating their way through systems that had already deemed them unworthy. Dr. Ramirez's class was also a space where I learned more fully about Chicano studies and I was actually quite surprised about this lesson because she was teaching in an American Studies department. I didn't anticipate learning about Chicanos in American Studies. But that's when I grasped, perhaps not fully then, that Chicano Studies was interdisciplinary. That those studying, writing about it, and teaching it weren't solely located in Chicano Studies departments. The University of New Mexico, where I attended college, 
had a program dedicated to Hispano, Mexicano, Chicano studies, but the breadth of Chicano studies wasn't siloed there. I tell this story about Dr. Ramirez's class because it was there that a seed was planted for Chicano studies. And for this Chicano first-gen college student, I didn't go on to get a degree in Chicano studies or even in American studies that would come later. But what I learned in her feminist and science fiction class and through her research made me aware that Chicanos, like African Americans and Native and Indigenous peoples, have been excluded and objectified. Dr. Ramirez taught me that Chicanos didn't sit back idly, however. She emphasized how Chicanos articulated and enacted what she identifies as their past, present, and future identities through what she labeled Chicana futurism. We were reading science fiction in her class, and through those readings she demonstrated how Chicano cultural production generates transformation. It acknowledges colonial and post-colonial histories, but it also, as Dr. Ramirez reminded us, complicates Chicano cultural identity and enables us to enunciate who we are. Alongside Dr. Ramirez, numerous Chicano scholars have written about Chicano studies and Chicano identity. Mexican Americans have used the word Chicano to describe people of Mexican origin living in the US since the early 20th century. Of course, identities are complex, we all know that. The term Chicano has a long history that connects ethnic Mexican peoples to pre-Columbian tribes in Mexico, so the Mexicas. But despite its longer history, the term Chicano has also been used as pejorative as a way to describe Mexican Americans of lower social class or standing, and perhaps with some racial overtones. It's also been used as a way to indicate political expressiveness, a radicalism, if you will, as in the activism of the 1960s that spurred the Chicano movement. And as he mentioned, Dr. Del Castillo will uh, discuss this history of the Chicano movement with you later on during his presentation. But it's important to note that Chicano heritage stems from deep historical roots, and it's also imperative that we acknowledge that Chicanos are not a monolithic group. Our culture consists of multiple discourses, diverse spatialities, and various activities. After Dr. Ramirez's class, I went on with my studies outside of Chicano studies. I got a degree in journalism and then a graduate degree in communication studies. But I didn't forget that seed that was planted. In my mid-20s, so many of the questions that Dr. Ramirez's class had encouraged me to consider resurfaced as I tried to make my way through my world. After moving out of state for a number of years, I returned to New Mexico with a strong desire to seek answers to those nagging questions that I couldn't let go of with regard to my identity as a Chicana. I became drawn to Chicana feminism because it provided a link to other mujeres who had been through the trenches of establishing a space for the racialized gendered and sexualized voices that had previously been ignored by dominant society. When I was introduced to Chicana feminism, it was situated for me in the 1960s. I understood Chicana feminism to originate from Chicanas who were active in the Chicano movement of the 60s and 70s, but who felt underrepresented by both dominant white culture and Chicanos, who saw the movement as a nationalist endeavor in which Chicanas sought social survival, social equality, and cultural dignity. And while the Chicano movement represented a broad assortment of organizations, activities, and individuals, it also perpetuated specific ideologies, objectives, and strategies that didn't necessarily account for the multiple identities of those seeking action against social, political, and economic inequities. As a social movement, the Chicano movement responded to a dynamic, changing, and multifaceted or in intersectional discourse, but it also undermined some of the stakeholders, and here I'm thinking specifically about Chicano feminists, which led to a sort of strain within the movement. Chicanas within the movement expressed lack of support for their specific needs as racialized, gendered, and sexed individuals. In response, Ch Chicanas enacted their own forms of mobilization. So here, I'm gonna start to show you a sort of genealogy of Chicana feminist writings that begin in the 1960s with significant figures like Martha Cotera, who was an activist uh, head of libraries. Uh, important, that's an important point. Um, and she was also a community liaison for the Benson Latin American Collection at the University of Texas. In 1969, 
1976, she published Diosa y Yenga, The History and uh, Heritage of Chicanas in the U.S., and then The Chicana Feminist in 1977. And Diosa y Yenga provided a genealogy of the Chicana historical legacy that inspired activists like Cotera. In it, she traces Chicana history from the pre-Columbian period to the 1960s. She discusses topics like education, health, housing, la familia, and accomplishments of Chicanas over time. The first line of Cotera's section in the Chicana historical legacy is telling. She says, quote, by understanding the past, Chicana historians hope that contemporary women will be better equipped to cope with the present and to determine their future. So when I first read that line, I thought of it as an early antecedent to the Chicana futurist ideology that Dr. Ramirez had re-emphasized during her Chicana um, feminism and science fiction course. Cotera and other Chicana feminists of the 1960s and 70s inspired the next generation of Chicana feminist scholars, like Kat Ramirez, my professor, and then earlier, Gloria Anzaldúa and Chiri Moraga, whose 1981 collection, This Bridge Called My Back, Writings by Radical Women of Color remains a foundational text that mixes genres, essays, poems, and short stories to create a genealogy of women of color activism. Women of color feminists continue to recognize Moraga and Anzaldúa's This Bridge as one of the most notable dialogues about transborder feminism. When the collection was originally released in 1981 on the heels of the Chicano and women's movements of the 1960s and 70s, it influenced feminist thought in important ways as it connected to kind of fem feminism to other third world feminisms. And Zaldúa released Borderlands La Frontera, the new mestiza, six years later in 1987. This significant text invited discourse and a critical examination of the multiple borders with which Chicanas were faced and continue to be faced. The, the physical and psychological borders that she describes as Una herida abierta, where the third row grates against the first and bleeds, and before a scab forms, it hemorrhages again, the lifeblood of two worlds merging to form a third country, a border culture. Borders are set up to define the places that are safe and unsafe, to distinguish us from them. A border is a dividing line, a narrow strip along a steep edge. A borderland is a vague and undetermined place created by the emotional residue of an unnatural boundary. It's in a constant state of transition, the prohibited and forbidden are its inhabitants. Anzaldúa's description of the border remains relevant 30 plus years later because we still haven't figured out how to address the emotional residue of the erasure of our histories. Her work was followed by a long line of Chicana feminist thinkers who generated foundational texts for the Chicana feminisms that were drawing me back to Chicano studies, including the insights of Martha Cotera's daughter, Maria, who would become one of my mentors. And you can see um, her collection and this other group of, of texts. So when I was finally back, drawn back to graduate school to get my PhD, it was because I was invested in answering the same types of questions that Dr. Ramirez had introduced to me when I was an undergrad. I can now better understand the positionality of the Chicana feminists whose work I was reading. I'd been out in corporate America unsatisfied with the work I was doing. I was doing marketing and I was doing technical writing and they both paid very well, but they were so boring and they weren't where I wanted to be. I had moved back to New Mexico and I decided that academia would provide a space where I could interrogate the questions I had about my own Chicano identity. And it's a whole other story, right, to think about um, sort of the violence of the institution sometimes, um, but I thought that that would be a space where I could get some of those questions answered for myself. I read Borderlands historian Emma Pettis' The Decolonial Imaginary, and that book really solidified why I wanted to go back to school, why I wanted to study Chicano history from a Chicana feminist perspective. Pettis describes the value of identifying and examining liminal spaces and interstitial gaps that reveal the, quote, unheard, the unthought, the unspoken, unquote. So do I expect you all to ground yourself in Chicana feminisms? No, certainly not. Um, but I share this introduction to Chicana feminist thought because I believe it provides a significant reason for why we need Chicano studies and reinforce that Chicano studies can guide our epistemological orientations by encouraging us to invite students to understand theory and analysis from what we know, to better understand how systems of knowing are also linked to the conditions under which people live and learn. 
Chicana feminists have developed frameworks through which we can better understand how and why our methodologies and epistemologies materialize from colonial heteropatriarchal histories and experiences, and they argue for the imperative of grounding our methodologies in decolonial approaches and oppositional consciousness, which Chicana feminist scholar Chena Sandoval describes as ideology in opposition, formed by those, quote, self-consciously seeking effective liberatory stances in relation to the dominant social order, end quote. This is the world in which we live right now. This consciousness is one that our students recognize because it's their lived experiences. The value of Chicano studies can be seen through example. In 2013, after a postdoc in Latino studies at the University of, of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, I returned to UNM as a visiting assistant professor in English and Chicano studies. This was a really pivotal moment for joining um, the faculty in Chicano studies. And here you can see uh, some of the, the faculty um, on the left and some of our, our students <clears throat> on the right. Their new director, Dr. Irene Vasquez, who's, uh, if you can see me, she's right next to me in that picture. Dr. Irene Vasquez was leading the faculty and students through the process of acquiring departmental designation for uh, Chicano Studies at UNM. The Chicano Hispano Mexicano Studies program, as it was formerly known, had been in existence for at least 40 years prior. But why hadn't they received departmental status? They were the largest Hispanic serving institution in the state, where Hispanic students made up at least half of their 29,000 students attending UNM. To me and to others, it didn't make sense. Beginning in 2011, Chicano faculty, students, and community members rallied to persuade the Dean of Arts and Sciences to push the Board of Regents to grant Chicano Studies wow. departmental status. On February 24, 2015, over 100 community members, students, alumni, faculty, and children from across generations stood together in a historic moment at Skulls Hall, 45 years after the proposal was first written, the UNM Chicano and Chicano Studies program became an official UNM department. reinforced my investment in ethnic studies and Chicano studies in particular. 
Many students we served at UNM had a firm grounding in Chicano culture, which was due not only to their educational endeavors, but also to their lived experiences. Like CSU Pueblo, UNM is a commuter school. Many of the students there remain living at home or not so far away. So they're tied to their heritage, but a number of them also believe that when they attend the university, they should embark on other journeys and disciplines that seem substantially different from what they know. Many times they would come to Chicano Studies to take a course where they thought they would know everything. More times than not, they'd be pleasantly surprised to learn new Chicano histories, to read Chicano literature they hadn't yet encountered, or to learn that Chicano Studies meant that they could study their own people or learn more about the place in which they lived and that this course of educational training was valid and legitimized by the institution. But they also found a community that same communal feeling I experienced coming into Chicano Studies as a visiting faculty member. My experience isn't exceptional, neither was theirs. But I think about the significance of Chicano Studies at a place like CSU Pueblo, where the community and the university can serve as a puente, or a bridge for connecting students to the interdisciplinary study of the Chicano experience. With the establishment of the Atzalan Center, you're at a pivotal moment in CSU Pueblo history to engage in research, teaching, and community outreach that specifically addresses the robust history of Latinx, Chicanx, and indigenous peoples and landscapes of this critically significant region. I'm particularly excited about your Colorado uh, Chicano Movement archives, right? As somebody who does archival research, it's like, ah, I'm so excited, so I hope you're as excited. This is a, a really good time, I think, to sort of pivot um, the discussion to thinking about the types of um, research projects and teaching that some of you might be able to do uh, that focuses on Chicano history. I primarily write about the 19th century, um, and because I teach at a small college and a really small program, I end up, um, and I was hired as the quote-unquote humanist, um, so that opens up a whole sort of wide spectrum for me in terms of my courses. But I delve into various um, centuries in my research and teaching because I'm in such a small program. So I'll share um, some of that with you now. Um, so some of you may have seen this document, uh, the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, when the El Pueblo History Museum had it on display um, during the opening of their Borderlands exhibition. This document became very important to my own research. Um, as I mentioned, I come out of an American Studies PhD program, and I was trained in Southwest Studies, Cultural Studies, and, and Chicanx literature primarily. Um, but as a grad student, I also received training in archival studies. So when I decided to uh, write a dissertation and then a book, I wanted to combine those um, interests, which manifested uh, in archives of dispossession. Uh, as a Chicana feminist, I employed Chicana feminist epistemologies to do a deep historical dive into um, 19th and early to mid 20th century Mexican history as it related to um, the US Southwest. And I was specifically interested in Mexicana history in particular. So the book offers a feminist reframing and recovery of archives that exposes the matrilineal dimensions of property ship and herencia or inheritance. It reveals resistance and negotiation by women of Spanish-Mexican descent upon the inception of the US legal system in 1848 um, by examining a body of text that I constitute, uh, uh, that I would label it, an archive of dispossession. And included in that archive are um, land title records, <coughs> Um, testimonials that were recorded in court cases, correspondence, memoirs, and literature. So I'll share with you just what prompted this project. Uh, when I was conducting archival research as a grad student uh, in the Spanish archives of New Mexico, um, I happened upon the testimonio of a woman named Maria Cleofas Bone de Lopez. And she was the daughter of an English immigrant and a Mexicana land grant heir. Her testimonio told an interesting story about matrilineal dimensions of property ownership that I saw repeated in a series of historical novels that I was reading that had been written by Mexicanas across uh, the early and mid uh, 20th centuries. And I labeled um, those historical fictional accounts, testimonios, because they really sort of paralleled the lives of the Mexicana authors uh, across the Southwest borderlands. So I was writing about women um, in New Mexico, in Texas, and California, and their experiences were really similar, right, in terms of the matrilineal dimensions of property ownership. 
So this archive, to me, really revealed evidence of the type of early Chicana feminist activism that we continue to see today. So if you remember when I was showing you that genealogy of Chicana feminist texts, right, and I said it was situated for me in the 1960s, well, I was seeing evidence of that same type of activism by these women as early as the 19th century, right? So that sort of initiative, um, I think, was started early on, although those these women that I write about certainly wouldn't identify as, as Chicana. But in my program in Southwest Studies, I use this research and experience um, in archival studies to develop a course called Archives of Power. And in this course, we trace the development of archive studies as an interdisciplinary method of inquiry, and we interrogate the archive as an empirically sound and quote-unquote objective form of public history and record. My students study current theoretical uses of the archive in Chicano studies, cultural studies, literary studies, and gender studies. So that gets to Deborah's question, right, about how do we um, incorporate those intersections in our classes. Um, and we think about rereading the archive and its foundations. The class, this class in particular, isn't actually tagged as a Chicano studies course. Um, but the archives that we visit and study are focused on Chicano and Native and Indigenous voices including our own Chicano archive, which is really small, but we have one at CC. Um, and we go to the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, where they have a really um, small, but a really rich repository of uh, indigenous and, and native activists and artists. We visit the Center for Southwest Research at UNM, which has an extensive collection, much of which is available online. Um, and then now I'll include the Aslan Center and the Hispanic Resource Center um, for this class as well. So great opportunities. Um, with the Aslan Center, I think your uh, possibilities, right, for the same type of research uh, would be amazing, right, for you all and for your students. Introducing students to primary sources like these can really sort of invigorate their interest in this deeper history of the region and also in Chicano studies. Uh, and, and it helps them, you know, especially those students who are from Colorado, right, to have an investment in home, right, that we've got this rich history and they can tap into it right here um, on their own college campus. It invites them to consider the interstitial spaces that Emma Pettis emphasizes in the work that might go um, ignored. This type of archival work can be expanded into exciting projects that not only focus on Chicano and Native and Indigenous history and culture, but into the digital humanities, which is also a very burgeoning area right now. Though we tend to be siloed in academic spaces and disciplines, the digital humanities allows us to consider the possibilities of collaborative projects for students and for your own research. So I'll share one example. Oh, sorry, that's, one of, that's the testimony I forgot to show you about. Okay, so this is one example. Um, in June, we at Colorado College Southwest Studies Program partnered with colleagues from UNM, UT Austin, the University of Houston, the University of North Carolina, Chicana por Mirasa Digital Memory Collective, Las Pistoleras Instituto Cultural de Arte, and the US Latino Digital Humanities Program. <clears throat> um, and we hosted and documented the Enrique Tabasco's Digital History Project field class. The class was co-taught by Drs. Tessa Cordova, Maria Cotera, and Linda Garcia Merchant, and it provided students with um, a hands-on experience in Chicano history, culture, and, and Chicano feminisms. And students learned how to conduct archival research, but also how to digitize archival material. In this iteration of the course, students digitized the personal archive of Enrique Vasquez, who was a leading figure in the Chicano movement. Um, and There. Um, and so, Enrique Tabasquez wrote for El Grito del Norte, which some of you are probably familiar with. Um, it was a bilingual newspaper based in Española, New Mexico, and it was co-founded in 1968 by activist Elizabeth Petite Martinez, who recently passed away, and attorney Beverly Axelrod. And El Grito del Norte was the official newspaper for Reyes Lopez Tijerina's La Alianza, and you've probably heard of Reyes Lopez Tijerina, he was a very vibrant figure um, within um, the movement. One of the neat things is that JSTOR, if, if um, those of you who, who use JSTOR as a database, is they've digitized um, El Grito del Norte, so it's all accessible, it's all free, um, and she kind of put Mirasa that Mario Cotero runs, also has issues available digitally. 
And I, I mentioned this um, field school because Colorado College, Las Pistoleras, where the institute was held, um, it, which is in El Prado, New Mexico, so just right by Taos, and Chicana por Mirasa, which is actually this digital collective, um, were always willing to partner uh, with other institutions like CSU Pueblo. It's a field, you know, so if a field school sounds appealing, right, something that you could do in the summer, um, we're happy to help you sort of bring that to fruition. Um, but if a field school isn't an option because of time and or funding, you might consider having students delve into the archive. Um, and so one of the things um, that's important to note too, and I'll show you um, now as we move into this next slide. Um, so here's just some El Grito primary documents. So I put together this um, Colorado Chicanx resources list for you. Um, and I included Chicana por Mirasa, which is actually um, not based in Colorado, right? It's actually based out of UT Austin, but it's accessible, and that's why I put it on this page. Um, and, and these slides can be shared with you so that you can have access to all of these links. We've got a wealth of archival materials available at our disposal, and I'll show you a few, a few of them. Um, and so first, can we click on the Chicana por Mirasa? So I wanted to show you Chicana por Mirasa because this is um, the digital repository that um, Maria and Tessa and Linda used to um, uh, incorporate Enriqueta's archive into. But it has a number of digital archives from Chicana feminists, including Marta Cotera, right, Maria's mother. Um, but you can join the collective. And so um, one of the great things is that Maria and Linda could come out to CSU Pueblo, right? Or you can work with them um, virtually, right? And your students can work on collecting. Um, they're very, very interested in collecting um, Chicana uh, stories from Colorado. So that's their next project. So just to think, I'm gonna work with them in my archive class, but this is something that, that you could do in your class, um, you know, even virtually. <clears throat> Um, and, and it gives your students an opportunity to work as part of the collective. They learn digitizing, um, they learn more about primary sources and what that means. And even you know, entering metadata, which sounds kind of boring, right? It's actually really interesting to think about or to have students think about right, the terms that you use um, for an archive, right? And if we think about sort of the, you know, the um, archival study sort of more broadly and who, who the archivists were at a particular moment in time, right, that's shifting. But think about the terms that they might have used to describe a Chicano archive and how accessible those might have been, or the, you know, just, I, that's something real, real particular. But anyway, your students can learn how to do that as well. Um, as you probably all know, you've got a number of great resources, and can we go back to the resources page, please? Thank you. So you've got um, great resources here in Pueblo, including um, the Chicano movement archives that, that have already been mentioned. Um, the El Movimiento exhibit at the Pueblo Community College, if you haven't seen that, that's also a great resource, as well as the Borderlands of Southern Colorado exhibit um, at the El Pueblo History Museum, but also at the other um, History Colorado uh, branch locations. And they're always willing to work with classes. Most importantly, you have a very active Chicano community in Pueblo. As Deborah mentioned, I come here any chance I get because it does make me feel like home, right? But every time I've participated in an event here related to Chicano history, the community's there. They show up. And I can't tell you how much that, that means, right? They were part of the movement, so you've really got a rich repository of first-person primary sources right down the street, right? They're your neighbors. Collecting oral histories from your Pueblo vecinos is a great way to preserve their stories. Like the Movimiento exhibit at PCC, your students could organize a collection of oral histories, put together exhibits, as in the Pioneers Museum. Can you click on the Pioneers, please? Right now, in Colorado Springs at the Pioneers Museum, they've got Una Familia Grande, which is a really small exhibit, but it's wonderful. Um, and it honors and makes known the Los Conejos neighborhood history through, through this exhibit. And it was a Chicano neighborhood in Colorado Springs that was you know, basically destroyed, right? It was demolished. Um, but the, the residents, um, it, it's a community-based history project for former residents of this Chicano neighborhood, Los Conejos, tell their own stories um, about their community's identity, history, and culture. So these are some of the ways that you can think about right, incorporating um, the really rich history in Pueblo as well. Um, I pulled this 
piece, this, is, this might look familiar um, to Deborah. I pulled this piece from La Cucuracha, which is a Chicano newspaper started by your very own Deborah Espinosa and her husband Juan, um, as well as David Martinez. And I'm going to use this in my classes as well because it's a great piece to think about the intersections of Chicana identity in particular and to juxtapose it with the infamous poem I am Joaquin, which you might be familiar with, right? written by um, Rodolfo Corgi Gonzalez, who's also a significant uh, figure in the movement in Denver. But I, I show you these uh, you know, primary sources because they're another way in which you can think about incorporating um, Chicano studies into your classes, right? I also teach literature classes. So for me, thinking about Chicano cultural production, right, and combining that with archival studies is one of the ways um, that I do that in my classes. So you have these rich opportunities um, to do that. The, the newspaper, La Cucuracha, is digitized, um, and so you do have access to that. In Southwest Studies at, at CC, you know, we're able to take our students into the field because we're on this really weird block schedule um, where we're, our students take only one class at a time and we teach only one class at a time. So longer trips may not be feasible for you all, um, but students can be taken to other locations via Chicano literature, for example, and through the use of tools like, um, you know, if you use ArcGIS, story maps, um, so that's a good way for students to be taken to another place, right, where they're creating creating a map themselves and sort of thinking about the spatial logics of, of Chicano studies and Chicano history. Um, in, I teach a, a class called Environmental Justice in the Southwest, and um, it's, it's framed right from um, a Chicano feminist perspective, but I incorporate a piece of Chicano literature in that class, which always surprises students, right? because most of the students who I get in that class are environmental um, science majors. And so, um, they usually don't expect to read a piece of literature in that class and surely not a piece of Chicana literature. But I generally assign um, Ana Castillo's novel So Far From God because it deals directly with environmental justice issues in the Southwest and, and New Mexico in particular. Um, and so then we get to talk about the environment um, in, in New Mexico, right? As we, as, so that kind of draws them in, right? To think about environmental science from that perspective of this agricultural community. And it just so happens to be centered on um, this family led by this strong matriarch, right? And, and talks about her, her daughters. Um, and it's a, a piece of Chicana literature that centers the Southwest um, and its inhabitants in, in a particular way that deals with environmental injustices. Um, I typically take students out in the field, but because of COVID this year, we weren't able to. So what I did was incorporate uh, photos of Tomé um, and did the story maps project with them. But also in order to, for my students to gain a sense of place, we talk uh, in depth about the history of the Tomé land grant, which has a very you know, complex history in terms of thinking about Spanish colonialism um, and sort of that residue. But it's a very vibrant community that has really worked hard to um, restore and also um, just create a space within their community cultural center that preserves that rich history. So normally we would go visit it, but um, we have photos, right? And I'm happy to share those photos too. And then thinking about uh, how my other colleagues in Southwest Studies engage Chicano Studies in their courses, right? And who may or may not be trained in Chicano Studies. I have a colleague, Dr. Santiago Guerra, whose uh, training is in anthropology, um, but he teaches a course on ritual medicine in Southwest, and I mentioned this to Damon earlier. And in that class, he's really honoring and exploring Native and Chicano science through the study of Native plants. And the students work on um, a garden. We have a Southwest garden, right, that, where we grow many of the um, herbal remedies, some of the um, herbs used in curanderismo, which Ramon will talk about, I think, in depth. Uh, and then they do um, a community teach-in, right, where um, we invite the local community and the CC community to walk through the garden, and students talk about the herbs and the plants. My colleague, Dr. Eric Paramount, um, who's a geographer, um, incorporates Chicano studies in his course on political ecology, in which he invites students to understand ecological concerns, um, and they do that through thinking about um, the struggles and ingenuity of Southwest cultures under changing social, political, and historical traditions. So not only is he teaching them about the environment and the ecology, right, he's also doing um, a historical dive um, into the region for those students as well. And then I have a, a colleague, our, our visiting um, professor, Dr. Nancy Rios, 
who's currently designing a course centered on Chicano murals. And it's based on her work with the Chicano Murals of Colorado Project, so CMCP. And that was one of the resources that I listed for you on the site. CMCP is an amazing organization to work with. Um, Lucha Martinez de Luna is the one who runs that organization. And uh, I've worked with Lucha to do both in-person tours with my students of murals um, throughout Colorado, specifically in Denver, where you can go to Denver. But she's also done virtual tours. So again, if you can't take your students out in the field, right, but you want to talk about art or our history or sort of the, long, the influence right, of, of um, Mexican artists on some of our um, Chicano muralists, uh, that's another good way. We also collaborate with our Fine Arts Center at CC, which has um, one of the largest Southwest arts collections in the nation. You don't see most of it because it's in the basement, right, in the collections. Um, and if, you know, if, if you're so inclined, you can request a tour. Um, they, they've sort of limited, right, who they allow um, downstairs now. But we have a permanent ex exhibition um, on Southwest art. And uh, our curator of Southwest art, Polly Nordstrand, um, and our educational coordinator, Ali Ehrensaf, are always willing to partner with um, community and other educational partners like you all to um, conduct tours, right, whether that's virtually or in person. And you can really sort of target, right, and plan around your course objectives um, to, to have those visits at the Fine Arts Center. So they're really trying to, it's been a major shift in Colorado Springs, um, specifically at this Fine Arts Center, to bridge the gap between um, the community and that institution in particular. So thinking about um, art history, for instance, um, that's another way in which you might um, be able to take your students there um, and provide educational opportunities. But the FAC, I also wanted to mention this to you all as well, also offers research fellowship opportunities. So if you're interested in exploring those collections, they offer fellowships that can be done at various times, right? I know that you're all busy and you're teaching or you're working or you're taking classes, um, but they offer opportunities uh, that provide a stipend for you. And then <clears throat> finally, I just wanted to share some organizations um, that are specific to Chicano studies that might be of interest to you and to your institutions. And the first is Mujeres Activas en Letras y Cambio y Social. Um, which, or MALX, as it's better known. And this is a professional organization for self-identified Chicana, Latina, Native American, Indiana, Mujeres, and gender non-conforming folks. Um, and there's a national chapter, so the logo that I'm showing you there is the national chapter of MALX. Um, and they provide mentorship and networking opportunities, um, as well as a summer institute, which just ended, actually, it was virtual. Um, or you can take students, or you can present, right? And I appreciate MALTS because it is very much um, directed towards not only academics, right, but activists and community members, artists, right? So it's a, it's a plethora in terms of thinking about um, the representation there. And we've actually just started, we don't have a logo yet, which is why in the middle it looks really sad, but we just started a MALTS Colorado chapter, um, and I'm co-chair of that. So if you're interested in becoming part of that organization, at least even at the regional level, um, I'm, I'm happy to talk with you about that. And we are to, trying to offer similar opportunities as the national organization um, for faculty, staff, students, and community members across Colorado. So right now we have members from um, Fort Collins, UCCS, Regis University, Metro State, uh, UC Denver and CC, and then we have a number of community members who also um, are part of the regional chapter as well. And we've hosted, um, you know, some virtual workshops um, thinking about self-care, what does it mean, right, to get through this pandemic. Um, and then there's the National Association for Chicano and Chicana Studies, or NOX, which Ramon may, may talk about a little bit later, which also um, was designed to serve academic programs um, and research centers pertaining to uh, Mexican-Americans and Chicanos. And the association has a really long history, and again, is a space in which um, you can really network, um, present your research, think through ideas, gain more knowledge, right? Just going to some of those um, panel conferences, and they host um, a conference yearly as well. But again, thinking about um, how you might incorporate um, these different organizations into your classes. So I've been talking about, you know, I've been talking at you quite a bit, so I think this is a good time for, for me to pause. Um, but I hope that some of these 
these points and these suggestions might be useful to you as you further consider um, the significance of Chicano studies and how you might incorporate them into your classes, into your research, or engage with students in talking about Chicano studies if they have like an inkling of interest right in these courses. Uh, so thank you for being an attentive audience. a good bit of time before lunch, and so I wanted to open it up for discussion. Um, I, I can walk around with the microphone if you have a question or something um, that we could talk about. Is that okay with you, Carrie? Yeah, that's totally fine. And I'm happy to show you some of those resources. I, I know I talked really fast. I always get nervous giving presentations, so I probably went through it really rapidly. That's okay, it was fascinating. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that a lot. Um, I have, I'm going to start off with a question. We call our program Chicano Studies, and I'm kind of an outsider. I'm not a Chicano Studies person, and I saw you use lots of different terms for programs. Um, can you talk a little bit about what is the state now? Um, Chicanx Studies, Chicano Studies, what, what, where are we going with that? I think it's shifting um, in terms of thinking about acknowledging right the, the various identities um, that make up you know quote unquote Chicano identity right that it's not monolithic and so um, I think in order to account right for the ways in which we identify um, that that program names are, are shifting right or department names are shifting to account for those various identities. Um, and I think that's important, right, in terms of thinking about um, inclusivity, right? And, and even for these organizations, I mean, we've had a number of conversations um, in mocks, for instance, about, you know, uh, anti-blackness, right, in terms of thinking about Chicano studies and, and Latinx studies. And these are important conversations that need to happen. Um, and, and some of the, the programs and departments may not change their names, right? But I think that they're, uh, in terms of the changing demographics of students and faculty um, that are teaching the classes, that are wanting to take the classes, that there is acknowledgement um, that we need to, to shift our thinking a little bit more in terms of uh, broadening, right, and being more inclusive. So that's why we tend to see uh, the AOX, right? Sometimes you'll see the little at symbol, um, but it's, it's to be more inclusive. I'm gonna ask it. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a dumb question. So if there's no dumb questions. So if you have any questions, feel free. When I see that at symbol, how do I pronounce that word? I say Chicana O, but how do you say it, Ramon? Yeah, O R. So yeah, when you start to discuss this, there's so many reiterations, and there's still a struggle about where we're gonna go with the title. It's not being resolved. I like your point about inclusivity, because then you know. One of the things that I don't think I don't think we should do is what's been done to us. And say to somebody, you can't be that anymore. You can't be Hispanic. You can't be uh, Latin. Yes, you can. We should have a community dialogue and work it out. Because then what happens is people say, well, you, you talk about respect. And I bring an idea here and it's not respected. So they had asked me to speak at UCD on that. And that's what I, I offer to them. So let's talk about it. Who are you? Why are you of that? Why are you choosing that name? And see if we can find a synthesis. And I don't think it's been found yet. In my opinion, my humble opinion, when you tell somebody they can't be that, you can become an oppressor. And the oppressor oppresses dichotomy. You can become that without even conscious, without consciously knowing it. And so I try to walk that ground, that sacred ground, through dialogue and say, how can we work this out? That day we didn't, but at least they heard my opinion about why I'm Chicano and then talked about Latin X and about Hispanic and about Latino and so forth. It's, it's still an unresolved issue. Mm -hmm. but, but we could trace it back to history because mm -hmm. the Mexican Chicano was colonized twice. They were colonized by the Spaniards in the 15th century. They were colonized by this country after the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And so they took our identity. They dismantled our identity on purpose back in the 15th century was under colonial, colonialism. And part of the healing process that we're trying to establish is how do we reclaim that and feel good about it? And some of the work that's being done in Denver through, through Jerry Taylor out of California 
is about any historical and intergenerational trauma. So it's something I don't I don't know, but but I certainly think at some point we just need to talk about it. And there, it's really interesting too because I mean there's still a lot of debate about the X, right? And a lot of folks are not on board with the X, but it does have a long history. And sometimes you'll see um, Chicana start with the X. Uh, instead, right, and so, um, so, so I think the dialogue is really interesting too, the arguments for and against, right, but I, I do agree, right, in terms of thinking about these um, multiple layers of oppression, right, that that's one of the things we really need to keep in the back of our minds. Okay, I've seen at least three questions, so I'm going to go in order, and I'd ask when I hand you the mic, just to introduce yourself, so Karen knows who you are, and go ahead with your question. I'm sorry, I saw Judy's hand go up, and I think she wants to respond to. Oh, I was just going to make a comment and reference. Yeah, please. To, okay. Uh, I was just going to make a comment to Ramon in reference to, uh, you know, when when we get into these dialogues, what I ended up finding in my classes is kind of that. Yeah, go back to uh, Corbin's point. I'm lost in a world of confusion. You know, and you'll have students really confused about their own uh, identity and when asked to, to uh, describe how they identify themselves, that even becomes uh, confusing. And, and not realizing that there's over 60 different, uh, I was gonna say tribes, uh, people that belong in that Latino or Hispanic category and that concept of that, you know, we're all of the same culture, not realizing that each of these groups have different histories, different political uh, uh, positions. So I think that's that was a really strong point. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. That's a good point. It's not a monolithic group. Yeah, that's a that because I, I think I think you know I think it's it's critical. Uh, my father, he's passed now, but uh, he used to come to Colorado to visit. All my brothers, we all live in Colorado now. And I would bring him and he would visit. And I was invited to UNC to do some lectures, some presentations, which I did. And on the way home, I knew something was bugging him. And so we, we got to the house and he said, Tengo que hablar contigo. I got to talk to you. I said, yeah, he was, you're a good teacher. And I got a question. ¿Qué es esta palabra chicana? Porque yo soy mexicano, tú eres mexicano, y nunca olvidas eso. That's how we brought you up. Well, my father was a Mexican. He was he born here, but he lived in Mexico and so forth. And so we had to sit down, my father and talk about that. Remember, in Kansas, the movement hit that, it didn't hit it nearly like it did here in the Southwest. And so even he was wondering what it was, and I said, Pappy, a chicano is a mexicano in this country. And I haven't forgotten who I am. He was a musician, so he was playing jazz way before jazz was even popular and getting in trouble. But that was, that was my father, so he had that strong wood. And sometimes we have to sit down and we have to have those open dialogues and conversations to, to clarify, because it, it, it does cause consternation, and then people walk off. And that's what they want us to do. They want us to be divided. And until we get learn how to use dialogue appropriately, respect people and say, listen, I understand. The question I always tell my students or anybody, I said, okay, that's cool. You can be that brother or sister. Can we work together? We got this problem in this community. Can you and I get together at the meeting? And maybe sometime we can talk. And then that usually resolves it. Okay, well, we'll, work, we'll do the work. Maybe the work will help us learn about each other because it, it's going to be there for a while. I don't think it's going to be resolved right away. You know, and I think that we have to live with those terms here because we are a Hispanic serving institution. So there are some words that get kind of imposed on us that we have to work within that system. Um, so, and, and I'm gonna bring up one other one that I think is controversial. So I'm not a proponent one way or the other, but what I hear often in, in, the, in Pueblo is people whose families have been here since the 16th century, and they say, oh, I'm Spanish. And that's another uh, dialogue, we, you know, we need to have that, that's a, it's a conversation, right? 
I experienced that in, a, in my family, and I know a lot of people have. It looks like someone raised her hand over there. She's like my mother is from Pueblo, born and raised in Bessemer, and uh, she really does not like the term she got because she thinks um, that they're troublemakers, you know, and so if you go back and listen to that. They also were um, deported if you were, if you self-identified a certain way, you were um, taken back to Mexico, and so I think there's a lot of history, and, and, and so she identifies as Spanish. And, and I don't, you know, and that's okay. And I respect her, you know, she wants to make a yeah, I agree. Okay, and you know, even for, for the people who the border crossed, there's so many layers to their own identity. Spanish, indigenous, Chicano. So I'm gonna talk as a genealogist, because I have the migration patterns and everything. And I grew up in the San Luis Valley, so I'm, I'm like you, I, but I call myself Manita. And when you identify yourself, you Mestiza and Chicana. Did you ever call yourself Manita? I don't, um, but I have um, friends who do, right? Um, and to have traced that, that path, what they call it Manita. And it's the people that kind of uh, were in, between Albuquerque and let's say Pueblo for the 300 years after the Spanish uh, arrived. The self-identification is the hardest thing for me. I grew up Spanish-American, pure Spanish-American. There was no indigenous in me at all. And that's how we grew up, and I think it was a lot because of the um, discrimination. We were not Mexican. Yet my dad used to say, um, somos mexicanos with a J, M-E-J-I-C-N-O, which is regional for that, for that area. But he would not ever say I'm Mexican. Mexican-American. So uh, self-identification is, is, is so difficult. And when I started at Adams State College, I saw these Chicanos. And they were telling me, you know, that my ancestors were really bad. And the problem was that we never studied our history. They never taught us. In, I took four years of um, American history in high school in Cuesta. And not once did they mention Juan Uñate arriving in 1598. So the problem was we were never taught our history, and that's what you know we need to do with all that we're talking about here. We need to take this history, you know, to the schools, you know, K through 12 college. But that self-identification is so hard, and we could spend hours talking about it. We we're trying to get another word for the Chicano the Chicano movement um, um, in um, at the Col history Colorado. Trying to name it something else. We spent an hour and a half discussing this, and finally we said, Leave it alone. Leave it alone. So, self identity is like, it, and it's so personal. And we have to, rep, uh, we have to really respect, you know, what, what each other, one of us calls ourselves. I'm, I'm stuck in that world of confusion. What is, when you say, when you say Manita, what do you mean, Shanita? Manita is um, the people that live in uh, New Mexico. Uh, they arrived in 1598, so those people that lived there for 300, yeah. Sorry. The people that lived in, Oñate brought the first group of Spanish people to New Mexico in 1598, and, and the people that came with that group were with the Vargas in 1692, and they lived in that New Mexico area. And I think the Manito, the, uh, two, two ways the Manito came uh, about, either through the Hermanos Penitentes, Mani, everybody called each other El Manito. Or the Brotherhood and Compadrasco system that everybody that, that was formed where all the neighbors raised the children. It, it, took, a, it took a village. So that the Manitos, you know, come from that. And if I ever say anything, I used to say, I'm from the San Luis Valley. Oh, you're a Manita. You know, and, and so, and, and in Pueblo, um, I try to teach this that there's two major populations, the Manitos, who came from New Mexico, and they, they're migrants, they're, they're never immigrants because they were here. And then the Mexican people that came in the very first part of the century, and they were called Sudamatos. And it sounds like a bad word, but it's not. It just means people from the South. People that came from New Mexico, skipped New Mexico, and came here for the jobs. And some went to Kansas. You know, but that, that's, you know, so you have those two major populations here, and then the new immigrants. And then you have, you know, a few um, 
you know, Puerto Rican and Cuban and so on. So it's really important to know what is the breakdown of the population of Pueblo. But I just, uh, the city, of one of the city's zoning people told me that the city of Pueblo is not 51% Hispanic, you know, under that umbrella. So, but anyway, yeah, self-identity is so hard. You want to respond to that? I just want to respond regarding that, and I'm glad you brought up. I grew up where, on my father's side, Manitos, on my mother's side, Sudamatos, making me It's Chicana. like a mixed marriage. Yeah, it was like a mixed marriage, and it was a, a very interesting <laughs> dynamic regarding perspectives. And when I and I would tell them, you know, that makes me Chicana. You know, because I have my indigenous. But the sad thing that I realized was that the Manitos thought they were better than the Sudomatos because they hadn't been here long. I, get, I don't know. It's, it's really confusing. But, you know, it is part of that lost in a world of confusion because when you grow up and people say, don't call yourself that or don't associate with being Mexican. But your family's from Mexico. You can't, you know, and that's part of, I think what Chicano studies is, is bringing the pride, but you know, not being ashamed. Red pudding is, uh, red pudding is capirotada for the surumatos and sopa for the manitas. Right. So even our food so and our language. So even our language and stuff is, is different. But that's why it's important to understand Chicano and identity and uh, what that means it's to folks. In fact, I've had people tell me, before I came into this class, I was Latina or Latino. Now I'm Chicana. Do you know what I mean? Because they realize what that identity means. And it recognizes our indigenous blood. And yet, there are people who tell us, you only need to be American. That's all. You speak English, you know, and um, <clears throat> be like us. So that's that world of confusion. Um, I don't mean, we don't mean to overwhelm. All of these labels and all of these um, uh, identities, mm -hmm. It's confusing to us. It's certainly confusing to all of you, and you want to be respectful, and you want to use the right term. Um, <clears throat> I think we need, you know, uh, it's important to follow the bloodlines. But what what we're learning already today is that we're not the simple people we were presented to be. If you think back, think about the images, the. Mexican pulling the donkey behind him, you know, uh, maybe with uh, the, there's a wood on the donkey's back. The Mexican sleeping under the cactus. We were quiet and passive and, and quaint and those kinds of images. Um, <clears throat> the first thing we have to dispel is that we're not a simple people with a simple history. We were colonized twice, first by the Spanish, then by uh, the US. So all of these border changes and movements, those are all geographical, regional identities. And, if, and, and a lot of people say, you know, can't you just make it simple? Well, we can't. Any more than the South and the North of the United States can make their history simple. We also have our regionalisms, um, our colloquial uh, languages, uh, uh, the way of speaking English. So we're not different. We're like you. We just have a different history and um, different origin. We are the people of Aslan. But if you follow our blood, if you follow our blood, we were first Native Americans, excuse me, yes, Americans, this is the American continent. And we were first um, indigenous, pure blood, Indian. We were never ashamed until somebody said, oh, you know, 
they've got to go, the Indians have to go. Then it was not so good to be Indian, right? So then we became Spanish. But if you follow that blood, we intermarried with the Spanish. So then we became mestizos, mixed blood. We're half Spanish and we're half indigenous. And so that kind of simplifies it. Okay, so that's why when they tell us, go back to Mexico, oh, wait a minute, this is our homeland before the United States. Yep. Okay, so and if you follow that blood and that history, during the Chicano movement, we became Chicanos because we wanted to identify ourselves not only as, uh, as being, um, we are troublemakers, your mother is right, but it's good trouble. <laughs> Uh, we 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 had to give ourselves a term that um, made us stand out as radicals. And what we did by claiming the term Chicano, we were stepping back to our blood. Stepping back to our blood because Chicano is such an ancient word. It goes it goes back to the Mexica tribes. That's our people, the tribes from the north. And so, uh, if you look at the word Mexica, I wish we had a, a whiteboard here. The CH uh, in, in the, the Spanish, uh, it, I'm sorry, in the Nahuatl is pronounced like um, Xcha, Xcha, Mexicano. We, the, Mexi, the Mexico, or the, 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 the Mexico tribes, or the Mexica tribes, all right? Mexi, we are the Mexicano. In Spanish, that becomes an X. Me, Mexico, Mexicano. That's how ancient the word is. <laughs> I know it's, it's a little hard to explain and follow, but <clears throat> It's so ancient, that that's why we called ourselves Chicano. It's, it's really, um, now what, it's Aztec. Aslan is the region of our country, uh, our origin. Being the Mexica tribes and the northern tribes, this is our land, the southwest is our land. So if you follow that bloodline and, and the language, it's a little simpler. We're mixed blood people who were colonized, and this is our homeland. And it's okay, yes? Oh, I'm wrapping it up. <laughs> so, uh, yes, so I'm trying to simplify it. I hope that helped a little bit. I'm a retired journalist. And words have meaning to different people. Um, you know, the, the first term I remember as a child was dirty Mexican. I thought dirty Mexican was one word. Uh, and my dad used to, and his brothers and, and other men, when they first saw each other, they would greet each other as dirty Mexican. Hey, you dirty Mexican, what you been doing? And, and, and uh, it, it's kind of our N-word. And, and I start there because I think what is important in terms of words and, and names and labels is what you call yourself. When I went to work at the Pueblo Chieftain almost 30 years ago, they used the word Hispanic. And I came out of the Chicano movement, we didn't like the word Hispanic. We feel like the word Hispanic was something that the U.S. government used to label us to, you know, I don't know, the first time I remember seeing forms on ethnicity, it said, are you Spanish, are you native, or, no, I don't know, I think native was used, uh, uh, Spanish surnamed, Mexican-American, there was no Chicano. And so of those choices, we were Mexican-Americans. You know, the organization in UMAS, 
that we started, or that was started in Boulder is the United Mexican American Students. And that was the term that was used in 1968 by those students. I recently did a publication for uh, the Boulder campus, and they want to use the word Latinx. And I, initially, my knee-gut reaction was, that, what is that? That doesn't mean anything to me. It's just another word that somebody made up to, uh, to take us to another vocabulary. Uh, but you know what? In that publication, we have the word Chicano, we have the word Mexican American, we have the word uh, Latinx, uh, we have the word Chicanx, and we have the Chicano with the and sign at the end, we have the Chicano slash a. Uh, so it, those are all just words that define people in different ways. Back to the newspaper, well, the time that I was there, I made it a policy that we use the term that the people that we're reporting about use. If we're talking about Chicanos, we, talk, we use the word Chicano. If, we, if they call themselves Chicano, you know, like I said, I came out of the Chicano movement, but I went to work at the newspaper. Frequently, people I knew were in the newspaper, and I wasn't going to call them Hispanic, because I knew that they didn't want that term. That's not who they considered themselves. So we adopted the policy of trying to identify people the way they identify themselves. And I think that goes a long ways towards settling this issue. If you want to be Latinx, be Latinx. If you want to be Chicano with an and sign, be a Chicano with an and sign. It does, terminologies in many ways separate us rather than bring us together. And you know, Chicano is a term that came out of the movement in the 1960s. And, and I understand the, his, the history of the word Chicano, but I also understand the political power the term Chicano had in the 1960s. It says we are not you, we have our own history, we have our own identity, and, and that's the term that has stuck with me all of these years. But I don't care what you call yourself. It doesn't matter to me. And if I write about you, I'll call you what you want to be called. Thank you, that's really helpful. Appreciate that. Before, be, before we see if anyone else wants to comment, I want to make sure, do any of our online people have any comments? Just wave your hands, okay. Does anyone else want to say anything else about this topic before we move on? One thing that's adding the confu to the confusion is the DNA and the DNA results. It's even, yeah. But I said, one of the things that's adding to the confusion now is, is the DNA that people are taking and and, and the result, and misinterpreting the results, right, George? Misinterpreting the results, we really have to be careful. And all of a sudden, we are coming up with this 40% in, in indigenous. That doesn't mean that your grandmother was 40% indigenous. You have to, you have to really be careful with those those results. But all, but the one thing that it has done is that all of a sudden, those people that didn't want to be indigenous, all of a sudden, they're taking you know this pride. But but you have to be real careful with those. And that's another addition to the confusion of identity. Identity many, many times was protected. We've already talked about the term Spanish. <clears throat> it, we protected ourselves by calling ourselves Spanish because the, um, so, uh, and, and we, we didn't want to be Indian. Well, we can articulate all of these terms, but our parents couldn't. My mother couldn't articulate that. She, we were Spanish because we're not Indians. We don't want to be Indians because that's the low, that's the bottom, you know, uh, in our world. <laughs> so uh, it was protection, and that's how our parents protected themselves. That's true. Um, I'm interested in the area of um, the, you use some great words for it, but, uh, the diversity of who we are. We're not monolithic. And um, when you look at the book that we published, El Viento Sigue published, um, El Viento de Pueblo, the cover of the book, center, front and center in that, um, 
that front cover photograph, which Juan chose, is a, a black African American. Because in Pueblo, there's not that many African Americans, and so they supported um, the Chicano movement. Chicano movement supported different activities that they did, the, the Black Beret, the Brown Beret. Um, the other thing is that I think, for me, the word Chicana means I have Native American heritage. So the spirituality that reaches out to me is very often Native American. And um, here in Pueblo, we have a strong, strong uh, community of Puerto Ricans because when they um, left the military in Colorado Springs, when they were discharged, instead of going home, they came here because this is where they came to dance. This is where they came and met women and so uh, married our Chicano women here instead of going back to Puerto Rico, which means Puerto Rican is very, very diverse. So you've got Chicana who's got African American hair. You've got a Chicana who's got Native American hair. And we know what we're talking about. Um, so, you know, Chicana to me means it's very diverse. But I think from the outside, you know, what, what I don't see visually represented here is the Chicano with the big African American buns, you know, in her, in her hair, the trenzas, the different ways that they, you know, have learned to fix their hair. Um, and I think that's part of the struggle is we're trying to be pure or something. The Spanish weren't even pure. They, they were not pure people. So, you know, part of Chicano is recognizing, and I wonder at what point these people that are 40% Indian indigenous are gonna say on their census, um, on their census bureau, I'm Native American. You know, I think that would give a lot of power to Native American uh, where they have disappeared. They're, they're not there. They're here. They're here in this room. Um, and I really appreciate the way that you have embraced the diversity of, of, of Chicanismo. Um, hi, my name is Sam Marigos. Uh, I'll try not to be nervous, sometimes I get nervous, especially amongst colleagues, uh, educators, stuff like that. Um, I am actually Muscolero Apache on my dad's side, Southern Cheyenne on my mom's side. Um, I am a Native American teacher and retainer. Um, it's my relative over here. We actually had even a great grandfather or a great great grandfather that was um, French. But um, even as Native Americans, we have our tribal identities. You know, I go by my Apache and my Cheyenne identity. But even within that, we kind of have a caste system where it starts off where you're full blooded and then it goes down from there if you're from. Uh, different tribes and stuff like that. If you're an urban Indian, if you're a res Indian, uh, we go through all of that. But in the end, it's all about cultural pride and cultural identity. Because when we get together as indigenous people, when we go to our uh, ceremonies or our powwows or whatever, the first thing that we ask each other a lot of times is, what, what tribe are you from? And we identify ourselves to that um, identifier of Apache, Cheyenne, Navajo, um, Dene, whatever you are. Um, and we go through that um, identity crisis sometimes too because some people don't look at us as being native because we're not full-blooded and we don't carry an identity card. Who gave you that identity card but the United States government? But yet we judge each other as people by that identity card. Are you enrolled in a tribe or are you a tribal member, all this kind of stuff? To me, I'm indigenous, those are my roots. This is where our people come from. All of us in here are indigenous. And um, recently, a year ago, I was chosen for a national program called Native Americans in Higher Education and Mentorships. I'm actually one of their regional directors of cultural and uh, Native American and Indigenous Studies. Our, one of our main uh, initiatives is to actually create uh, Native American and Indigenous curriculum for K through 12. Um, and not only that, but it's gonna be taught by Indigenous people from um, local tribes and um, tribes throughout the, uh, the nation, stuff like that. 
There's an estimated 564 recognized tribes, again, by the United States government. But it goes far beyond that. There are hundreds and hundreds of tribes uh, that ain't recognized by the United States government. Again, that marginalizes our people because they're saying, well, because you're not recognized by the government, you're not an official tribe or your people don't really exist. And that's really a problem a lot of times because us as indigenous people, as native people, we don't exist because our history has never really truly been told. And it really needs to be told and that's part of our initiative is to get into the school system, get out there into the community and start teaching the children the true history of this land because it goes thousands of years beyond uh, what we consider the United States of America and stuff like that. And I hope everybody in this room becomes part of that initiative because we need your knowledge, we need your wisdom to go in there and continue to teach our children. Because again, it goes back to cultural pride and building those roots deep within our children because uh, not only that, I created my own organization which is called um, Seventh Generation Education Alliance, again, where we go into the schools and we teach that cultural history so our children become um, proficient within their own culture, stuff like that, and they start asking those questions. Who am I? Who are my people? Who are my ancestors? Where do I belong? And it's all part of that, you know, and um, being an indigenous person is a big struggle in this country a lot of times because I'm also a professional entertainer and I see both sides of the fence. When I'm a professional entertainer, non-natives, white people, they love us, they welcome us, they, they like worship us in a way which is kind of crazy. But then when I become myself as a, a Native American activist, they want to destroy me, they want to kill us, um, they shoot us and they, they rape us and they, they do a lot of different things to us and prison us just because we're expressing our First Amendment rights. You know, and I think, well, does First Amendment rights only exist for non-Indigenous people, or does it exist for us too? It goes back to teaching our kids again their cultural pride, who they are. It doesn't matter if you're Chicano or you call yourself Indigenous or Latinx or, or Hispanic, whatever. We have to really look at where all Indigenous people, our roots are here within this land, and we should be proud of who we are, proud of the color of our skin proud of our ancestors and where we come from and stuff like that. And until we start teaching that, um, it's going to be really a struggle. And I know there's lots of uh, struggles that we're going through because a lot of non-natives don't want history told from an indigenous perspective. But a lot of you here have been doing that for, for, for decade after decade. And that's, it's just an honor to be here with you. And uh, we need to get out there. There's a lot of work to continue to be done. One of the things that we do is connect our uh, youth through our ceremonies, um, teaching them our ceremonies, um, teaching them their roots in that kind of um, basis like that. I don't want to go on and on, but um, please get together with me before the end of the day because I think all of us here collectively can work together to further not only Chicano studies here at the university, but elsewhere, and then add indigenous um, Native American studies to that. Thank you. Thank you. I had no idea when I asked that question that it would be such a great discussion, and it just goes to show how much dialogue we need about identity, and I, I really appreciate it. Um, Karen, do you, should we, do you have a, you want to move on in a different direction? Sort of in a different direction, definitely uh, into, the, into the weeds. Um, in terms of cultural appropriation, as a non-native, as, a, as someone who wants to contribute, um, how do we walk that delicate path of being respectful and trying to inform, but recognizing full well this isn't our lived experience and, and not wanting to speak outside of our expertise, but wanting to be inclusive. And so um, my question initially came up in my head when you had mentioned about a Southwest Garden, and that it was something I was thinking about for a class I'm uh, trying to develop with some folks on um, indigenous holistic health and healing arts. And I thought, you know, a, a community garden like that on our campus might be might be a wonderful project. And listening to the book Breading Sweetgrass and thinking, 
could we grow sweet and I'm like, and I'm instantly in that place of, oh, that sounds like a great idea, and maybe that's a really a, a wrong idea. And so I want to be respectful of sacred, um, you know, um, ceremony and and, and uh, uh, healing uh, medicines, and I want to be informative in this class and experiential with project-based learning. And so I, I'm I'm seeking wisdom on how to be mindful and respectful and Important. I mean, one of the ways that we've done it, right, or the way that we frame um, our pedagogical approaches in Southwest studies, and I don't know if this is, you know, I mean, I think it's it's starting to be more common across the board, is thinking about, like, how do we decolonize our, our classroom spaces, right? And, and then, but I think that's a really great question, right, to think about what is that fine line between cultural appropriation, right, and, and decolonizing your classroom? But I think, I mean, you've already like sort of hit the nail on the head, right, in terms of thinking about the book of Breeding Sweetgrass, right, that you're acknowledging those indigenous voices, that they're, they've you know, written, they've got oral histories, right, we have the same thing with Chicano studies. Um, so I think if a student were to come into your class and see, you know, what you're reading, how you're engaging those practices, because a lot of it is about praxis, right, as well, in terms of, of your approach, um, but that makes a huge difference, right? That you're not appropriating because you want to start a garden, right? That you're acknowledging the deep, rich, rich history of the region and its peoples and, and traditions and cultural practices. But I think part of that, that work also needs to happen in terms of like decolonizing not only like our syllabi, right? The reading lists, but the, our actual praxis, right? Acknowledging that those practices have been in use thousands of years, right? It didn't just start with like the environmental movement, right? Um, and so, I, I mean, I think that there's a, a way to balance that. Um, and that's one of the ways that we've done it, right? It's really making a, a conscious effort to switch up um, both the theories that we use, but also the praxis, right? How do we engage our students in that? We, oh, sorry. I just wanted to respond to her question real quick about uh, cultural appropriation. I think in many ways, too, I think non-natives have also gotten ripped off of their culture, too, because how many white people actually know their true cultural roots, their cultural identity, and really celebrate that, you know what I mean? Like, you guys think of your history as 200 and whatever years that America has been in existence. Your culture goes far beyond that to your, your cultural homelands, your ancestral homelands. How many of you know your cultural roots, whether you're Scottish, uh, Polish, Irish, whatever? And I wish that you guys would, too, explore your cultures, your ancestry, and embrace that, too, and celebrate that, too, and pass that on to your children. Because it's really important if, if you go down to the origins of people and, and the similarities that we all have as, as human beings and stuff like that. And I would love for you guys to really, too, Explore your culture beyond the United States, go thousands of years back to your true origins and stuff like that. So true, thank you. I'd like to just share something uh, in response. Uh, we, all, we actually had a class in Chicano studies called Out from the uh, Chicano uh, and Chicano Community. Uh, and one part of that part is looking at indigenous healing practices taking a look at, you know, our natural herbs and stuff that we even have here in our area. And that might be something that we could work on and collaborate together, because that's what this is all about. How can we help you in, implement Chicano studies in your curriculum? How can we strengthen where it's uh, reflective of inclusiveness and, uh, you know, we, we talk about curandarismo or, or folk killing. You know, it, it goes back, and there's reasons for it, and there's methods and even ritualistic spirituality that comes in with, you know, how do you perform a susto ceremony or uh, something like that. But uh, I'd love, we need to get together. Yeah, absolutely. Because I want to build, I want to build this class and I was also looking at um, the health promotion area. Yep. And so let's connect. <laughs>
brings up a great point too in terms of thinking about the collaborations um, because I've learned so much about you know areas that I'm unfamiliar with in co-teaching with colleagues. So that's another way to sort of like get your feet wet, right? Learning from folks who have been um, studying and thinking about these other ideas. Um, but uh, but uh, I, I think what we're, we're hearing here also, right, in terms of this collaborative nature, and I'm not gonna, I know that I'm one super busy, but Ramon wrote a whole dissertation on curandarismo, right? So he'd be a great person to talk, to talk with. Um, but the fact that we're all here, right, already shows that we're invested in this. So, you know, enabling those collaborations, I think, is going to be really significant for, for making, you know, what you all want to do here at CSU Pueblo a success. And that, you know, because we're all invested in coming from, you know, sort of different areas and, and walks of life, right, it shows that we're willing to walk the walk in order to make this effective and, and to happen, right? And, and I think, you know, in academia, because we are so siloed sometimes that we feel like, Oh, or, you know, everybody else is busy too. Yes, we, we recognize that, but it's something that we're invested in. Your community is invested in it, right? So I think that's important to recognize the experts who are in the room, you know, um, from your community. I learn so much every time I come out to Pueblo from the community. You know, I every time I leave here, I learn a new historical fact. Um, and, and so I think that that's important to recognize too. Um, I, I was in a, a panel presentation last year for the um, Western Historical Society. And I ta was talking about the community partners that I work with and one of the respondents at the panel said something, you know, not necessarily demeaning, but I kind of maybe took it that way in terms of um, who he thought my community partners were. And I had to say, you know, they're all credentialed, right? Because they're not in the institution it doesn't mean that they don't have, you know, the knowledge or the know-how. Um, so I think that's important to, to recognize, right, that those experts, even our students, I mean, our students are so knowledgeable. So what do they come to the table with, right? I think that we have to give them credit, too. Yeah, I, one of the people that's uh, virtually online, Alegria uh, Rivadineva, she's our chair of our Spanish program, and she's a nationally known expert on teaching uh, Spanish for native speakers. She's developed a whole curriculum around that, and I think that you know it's really interesting in light of what you just said. If she wants to comment, she can pop in. Okay, who's next? I think I can say it louder. Oh, I'm sorry. You can just wait. I think it's like a question, not a one. Okay. Um, I'm just curious. My name is Kevin Van Winkle. I'm the uh, director of the communication and rhetoric and writing program here, and my background is in technical communication. I apologize, my question might be just really specific to me, but I'm wondering, because uh, I'm always looking for ways to inject the things we've been talking about into my own pedagogy and classroom practices, but as you said, technical writing can be perceived as, but it actually can be boring for some people. Did you see connections between any technical writing experience and then your research and scholarship in these areas that you've talked about today? Um, that's a good question. Not necessarily at the time. I mean, I was doing technical writing for um, a software development company first, right? Um, and then second, it was for the government. Um, so it, I guess for that government job, I would say yes, because I was writing about processes, right, related to my region and then also nationally. So I think there was a connection, right, in terms of, of that particular position. Um, but I think. I think one of the other things to think about with something like technical writing is, is um, an assumption, and I think about this specific to CC, um, we don't have a technical writing class, right? But I think about the assumptions that we have with our students coming in, um, that they've all had the same type of training even in, in high school, right? And they don't. Um, so I think acknowledging even that is something that can contribute to the way that we teach um, our regional students, right? That we assume that they come in with a particular level of skill or knowledge, um, and that um, we don't have those same expectations for other students. So I think even that, in terms of thinking about the training that you provide in those classes, might be something to consider. But in terms of like the the specific um, writing that I was doing, there wasn't necessarily um, a direct connection to to ethnic studies per se. Oh, okay. That's a great question. I'm trying to think now you've made me think ways that you could get students to write uh, technically. 
<laughs> yeah, my specific interest is in euphemism, and so mm -hmm. I think in government documents how, they're, how people are referred to, which ties into the initial discussion that we, that we began the question and answer, you know, how does that inform, how does the government write about people mm -hmm. uh, with the, the person and issue of inclusivity that we're talking about, right? I mean, similar, now that I'm thinking about it, right, in reference to, like, the a metadata example that I gave, right, of creating those archives, the same thing, right, with the technical writing. So I guess that could be a connection, too, in terms of thinking about the type of language that's used, right, the labels that are used. Um, and because, and, and to go back to um, Sam's point in terms of thinking about, uh, like, the tribal identification cards, right, one thing that we, we um, can tend to shy away from is thinking about the sort of larger structures, right, that dictate how we identify and why we identify, right? Um, and and even like with cens census data labels, right? Like who gets to choose those labels and why, right? So I think that is um, a good point for your students to think about, right, in terms of an assignment about being, um, I mean, inclusive on the one hand, right, but also thinking about um, terms and phrases um, and how they're used, right? Speaking of terms and phrases and something that came up earlier and I'm especially maybe addressed to the faculty that are here, when you think about these issues and how you'd like to develop your curriculum, are you interested thinking more, are you thinking more on Chicano studies and how can I integrate that or are you thinking more about Southwest studies and we should build more of a holistic Southwest studies perspective in the curriculum or both or you know just curious maybe where your thoughts are about that anyone who wants to jump in or for the community you know to anybody uh, what do you in my own opinion we need to maybe do both things here at CSU Pueblo and for different reasons I can see that as a benefit to our community as well, to raise awareness of both kind of disciplines. Judy? I want to say huh, that it's really important, you know, to have the community as part of what we do. Years ago, and, and part of it, they used to have, before, before we were recognized as a real discipline, uh, and when they started implementing uh, Chicano studies courses because of the demands of students. They used to have vario professors because they, they couldn't find folks that had, so, and these were people that were community activists uh, that they would hire. Uh, one of the sad things with our vario professors is that they didn't live, uh, they, they, they didn't stay in the higher education because they didn't get the credentials that you need it for tenure. Uh, but one of the things I think we learned from the Vanio, Vanio professors, and in some ways I was at that point where I was probably one of those Vanio professors they hired because I fit the, the bill at that time. Uh, but the expertise of people within our community that we could actually, and, and I have many times brought in folks from the community to uh, provide a lecture or, or work on a project or work with students on different areas because the community has a wealth of expertise. And I think that knowledge is really valuable uh, regardless of the credentials. And I wish we could in many ways go back and hire you know, the folks that we called the Vario professors to come in and have community activists teaching courses. But as professors, we could bring in people that have these certain ideologies or values or perspectives to add some diversity in our classes. And so that, that is another method of, you know, bringing in other expertises, bringing in community members to provide a lecture or two in, in your courses. In fact, years ago, uh, when we were looking for, uh, we used to bring in uh, Deanna Velasquez out of, uh, De and I think you worked with her, right, Ramon? You were really close with her. 
uh, and she was a curandera and highly recognized, so originally from Texas, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and you know, we would bring in folks that have this kind of expertise. We're losing our old traditional curanderas, uh, but there is like postmodern <laughs> that they're calling themselves. <laughs> But you know, it's, I think it's that's an important avenue is to utilize our community resources in developing our curriculum. If I could, um, my name is George Onaby. I had the honor to leave Mecha 50 years ago to hold the demonstration here on campus to get Chicano Studies. We had a fight to get Chicano Studies on campus. It ended up that we met with the president. There was 200 people out. They said, we're closing down the campus unless we get Chicano Studies on campus. In the meantime, the sheriff's department's coming in with their riot gear. We put our academic lives on the line because had it gotten violent, I wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> um, we fought. We had gone up to see Corky Gonzalez at the Crusade for Justice. There's where we met the people from Umas. That's where we met the people from Mecha up north. We gained their knowledge. And then we went to California, University of San Diego. There we got to see Chicano Studies experiential training. But they took us to another level other than beyond just the academic reality. They said, one thing we have is called a barrio station. What the hell is a barrio station? We go into the community, we set up a storefront, we invite young people in, we help them get their GED, we help them get financial aid, and we recruit them to the San Diego State at that time. And they become part of Mecha. That was their, their feeder, okay? Um, this barrio station, when we came back from California, we set up Chicano Studies here. And we looked at the Barrio Station concept and he says, how can we do that here in Pueblo? Well, we uh, went to the projects. The only where the projects is over there on Prairie. The projects has a wall higher and thicker than any prison because it's a mental wall. These kids are caught up in that reality. They can't get out. They end up dropping out of school. Many of them, their dads are brothers are all incarcerated. So we went, that was the place we wanted to go. We went in, uh, Jack Quinn gave us an office to work out of. We set it up where we would send students down to the bio station to help the kids, we'd do recreation. We would show them how to use a typewriter at that time. And started to get uh, these young people to change their direction in regards to looking at Canyon City, going to prison, being their future. Many of those young students we ended up recruiting and getting them into the university over here, and many of them have done outstanding jobs. The concept of a audio station is going back into your community. Chicano studies is first, we as art people identifying who we are and what we're all about. The second one is to help other people and understand who we are. But the third concept in Chicano studies is giving back to the community. You get educated, you take off, you don't come back, you're taking all the resources and you don't have nothing to give back. The Vadio Station was the way we were able to give back because it was in the community, it was a real entity. The program was called Project Adelante. And Project Adelante, we ended up getting money from the city. After we graduated here, we ended up getting money from the city. We set up programs, we had drug prevention programs. They were the first ones to deal with glue and paint being available for the kids at the projects because they were all huffing. You get enough huffing, you grind, your brain goes to mush. We got a law passed in the state of Colorado to take those off the shelves and, and lock them up. Project Adelante was the one that pushed that reality. The second one was pretrial intervention program. These kids were being arrested for almost nothing, ended up with a court record, getting incarcerated, and then uh, get there in the system. We set up a pre-trial court intervention to where instead of the kids being sent up, 
they would do community service, or they could wear a um, ankle bracelet, saving a lot of money. Project Atalante was in the forefront of that reality. That was all that came out of Chicano Studies. We were all students of Chicano Studies. We set up the bio station, we got funding from the city. Another program we had that we set up after we graduated with the Southwest Institute for Human Development. We were doing voter education registration. We were using CETA funds for one year until Congress found out what we were doing and they sent a special law to keep it from happening again. It was nonpartisan, but uh, they kiboshed it. We were doing housing in regards to getting people housing. Um, these were all people who had come out of Chicano Studies to set up nonprofit corporations. We found out in San Diego, their barrio station even went further. Their barrio station ended up setting up uh, shopping centers, housing developments. That, to me, is where Chicano Studies should be at, in academia, helping the community achieve those goals of housing, of dealing with um, um, health disparities, dealing with the juvenile system. Because eight out of 10 in Buena Vista are Chicanos. They're being fed into that system on a daily basis. It's our people, and we have to do something. And Chicano Studies, to me, is the way to do it. Um, Chicano Studies was a base. From there we built, and we took it to the next level. We went back into the community. Now, what you're doing is even more so, because here we are 50 years later, and we're saying, okay, where do we go now? What's our future? Ramon and I got to work together in Denver and we set up the Hispanic Research Institute on Education and Economic Development. We hired Polly Baca Baragan. Polly was the executive director. We had a leadership program. Many of these leaders ended up on the boards of many corporations in Denver. We set up an entrepreneurship program, Fast Track, 18 month certificate program to get Latinos into business. Many of them ended up, uh, one of them ended up Richard Martinez, he was from Pueblo, took the program, got a, um, a certificate, got his four-year degree, got an MBA. He is now the president of the Children's Bank in Denver, okay? That's what Chicano Studies did. It set up these other programs that enhanced our community to where we have people that are bank presidents right now. That's why it's so important what we're doing now. Because again, we're investing in the future of our children. And where are they going to be? Thank you. Thank you, George. I, I, I really appreciate everyone's comments. I've learned a lot myself this morning, and you know, to what I what I'm hearing, what's in my mind right now is that as we move forward, there's the one piece that you helped us with this morning, with a list of resources that faculty can look to, that we can all look to to sort of diversify the curriculum. And then in addition, what I think is maybe even more complicated is this, how do we bring the community in and how do we reach out to the community and build those partnerships and make a difference? Um, so we're gonna keep talking about these things all day. I wanna, I, I think at this point, we should maybe take a break. We've had a long morning, we've had lots of dialogue. Lunch will be served at 12 o'clock out here and you can grab your food and bring it back in. We have a break until one o'clock, so take, Take some time to meet someone in the room that you don't know, find out where they're from, get some food, relax a little bit. Um, food is, is 